Hello everyone, uh, this is uh, another episode of Unisoft Law YouTube show and on this show me, Pulat Unisoft, uh, commercial litigator from Toronto, talk to mostly lawyers and sometimes other professionals and uh, my purpose is to chat with interesting people, satisfy my curiosity but also bring out a range of talent that we have here in Toronto and in Ontario and maybe outside of the province in the future, who knows? So today we have uh, a fantastic guest. His name is Addison Cameron Huff and uh, you can see him on your screen right now. In the uh, work from home edition here. Yes, hello Addison. Hello Pulat, good afternoon. How are you? I'm doing well enough. I mean, people ask that question, but yeah, things are maybe not going so well uh, outside of my practice and life, but things are going well. My niche is crypto law. That's booming. Mm -hmm. Lots of projects going on, lots of interest there, mm -hmm. partly due to the pandemic, probably people see it as a bright spot. So things are going well for me, maybe less so for other people in the province right now, but you know what, you're absolutely right. And I haven't thought about it. When people ask me how I am today, I never think that the world is undergoing a global catastrophe, essentially. Hundreds of thousands of people have died. Only today we heard the terrible news from uh, Lebanon about the, this terrible explosion there. But and I, 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 it's, it's terrible. It really shocked me. But... Um, Life goes on. So we have to talk about other things. And uh, I hope that our meeting today will be an outlet for all of those other things. You know, Addison, when I think about you, I think about uh, four categories of things that you did. And I, before I get into that, I must say I've known you for quite a few years. And uh, I've always respected you, and I'm really thankful that you're here today on this, on this show. Thanks, Pulet. I think of four categories of, of things that you did, and you please tell me if you think of more or if, if I got it right. So number one, private practice. Number two, general counsel in a company. Number three, an executive running a technology company. Number four, a tech entrepreneur and code or software developer slash code or software developer. Did I get this right, Addison? And soon YouTube star as well. I hope so. Yeah, Thanks my, to you, Pula. My, my show is not, it's picking up slowly. So hopefully, yes. So of these four categories, is there any category that defines you that we can say this is Addison? Mm, people love categories. They're easy, right? It's a good yeah. label. It makes people think they understand something, but I don't think of my own life in categories like that. I see them as being connected and most of my clients do too. Like the main reason people hire me is that I really understand technology. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm a lawyer. I'm not the best lawyer in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm not the best programmer in the world. There are not so many programmer lawyers that really understand the business issues people face too. And that's why people hire me. So for my business and professional career, the categories all blur and they're the key to it. If I just had a single category, well, it'd be a lot harder because if you want to be the best lawyer in the world, good luck to you. That's a very mm -hmm. competitive field. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have to be because people don't need that. They don't really want that, right? They want someone who's quite a good lawyer, but also really understands their business and really understands the subject matter. So I've found that blurring the categories makes it hard to engage with other lawyers who are looking for that categorical view. It was mm -hmm. certainly a problem for me looking for jobs a number of years ago before I gave up on that mm -hmm. and just pursued my own things instead. Right. And along the way, I've worked for other people too, but not as an employee within a law firm um, or an employee in a large company long term, where you have to fit inside those categories. That's how they operate. 
Right. So it's a problem for dealing with some people, but it's a huge benefit for dealing with the kinds of people that I deal with. So your shtick is a lawyer who understands technology and all these four categories are really uh, facets of this holistic experience that uh, you have developed over the years. Sure. And I think that's what lawyers should try to do too. It's what people want. Right. People but, want a lawyer who really, really understands what they're doing because otherwise, are you going to do a good job of it? Now, some areas of law like litigation, maybe that's less relevant too. But for my kind of solicitor work where people are looking for advice, which is what should I do for my business in these circumstances? Mm -hmm. If you just answer that from a legal perspective, it's probably the wrong answer. Right. Mm -hmm. Why do you understand technology, Addison? Why do you say that? Doing it. Tell us about uh, your experience with technology, because the reason I'm asking this question is I know a lot of lawyers who think and say that they understand technology. <laughs> and uh, if you go to one of those tech conference, law tech conferences, uh, and I'm not talking about uh, necessarily about conferences dedicated to technology companies or technology products, for, uh, or developing technology products, I'm mostly talking about uh, practice management conferences, right? So there are a lot of lawyers who say and think that they understand technology. Why do you say, what gives you the right to say that you understand technology? Tell us about your credentials. That's a really good point. I think a lot of people are saying they know technology as in they understand the idea of it or maybe what the benefits might be, but not how it works. And they wouldn't know how to make new technology. That's what I do. So I've started a bunch of internet businesses, some of them kind of complicated, others more simple. Uh, when I was younger, I won a bunch of programming competitions as well. That's what I mean, like really understanding, it. being able to architect programs, to know how they work. You can write software, you can write computer code. And, and we have to make this cl clear. We have to uh, make yes. this explicit. Actually being able to do it, to change it, to make new things, to understand yes. truly how it works, not to be able to read what somebody says the features are or right. what the marketing brochure says. Like, I don't right. think that's understanding technology. That's right. understanding technology the same way I understand manufacturing. I understand it exists and that good things come out the other side. But I couldn't tell you how you go about designing an assembly plant and if I saw something manufactured, I couldn't look at it and have insights into that manufacturing process. I could only look at the manufactured product and say, well, that's good. I couldn't tell you, oh, this could be 50% smaller easily. Because knowing that depends on knowing about plastic injection molding and the sizes of the tools and whatever else they're doing there, right? And you would say, well, how hard could it be to make it 50% smaller? And the engineers would say, well, it's impossible. It requires a different kind of factory and we don't do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, the conversation usually ends there when the engineer says something. And until that point, everybody has an opinion, everybody has a take. But then when the engineer or the expert comes in, then all opinions terminate and this is really the final, the final judgment. I, I completely understand what you're talking about. Uh, tell us about... Uh, software that you wrote personally. So you actually sat down at some desk somewhere, you had a computer in front of you, you had a, uh, a programming code editor in front of you, and you actually typed in, I just want to dumb it down and, and really uh, make it detailed uh, to uh, dig out what exactly you did and how exactly uh, in what exactly uh, in what way exactly you were experienced with software so you're not just talking about it but you were actually sitting at this editor and you were typing in computer code in what programming language 16 years ago when I was in high school the principal came to myself and another student in the computer science class one of my really good friends today, he works at Facebook, and came to us and said, can you do a 
parent-teacher interview process online. And myself and my friend, we programmed that system. And another friend of ours in high school, years later, got involved with that business, and it still exists. So very little of my original code probably is still a part of the code base. Um, but that was the first commercial product I made that was used at that high school. It's still used at that high school, and it's been used with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of parents all over the world since. They now have customers in several continents. So that was one of my first real systems. Um, PHP and HTML, CSS, like a pretty standard application with MySQL database. There you go. And I've made lots of other things since. Project I started in 2014, 2015, with an Israeli lawyer who was doing his PhD in law and regulation in Toronto, uh, global regulation, which I'm also not a part of today, but still exists, still the largest international law search engine. And that search engine, I wrote code to go out and index government websites, download all their laws, process them into a format that's somewhat structured, and then when they're not in English, translate them using machine learning APIs, bring them back into the system, and then make it searchable. So and, wrote and all that, that code for doing that. That company still exists, Global Regulation. It does. And, and that, product, that product is still shipped to customers. Yeah. And Tell us about some I don't, of the I don't know the current customers, but yeah. uh, when I was running it with my co-founder and I assume today they still have them like the Department of Justice in the United States. We had KPMG US be a part of it at one point. Uh, lots of the top research universities in the world are subscribers to it. And the reason why is that there's no other service for it. There's nothing for searching the laws of 80 something countries. And there's no other product where you can search in English across laws mm -hmm. originally in Chinese, Vietnamese, French, Italian, all these different languages all merged into one. And you can see the original in the original language. Interesting. So you have your experiences across the board from sitting at the uh, uh, text editor and writing the code of, of your program to debugging, to building, to uh, 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 packaging uh, and deploying it uh, on the sure. customer side, shipping the product. And I assume it also includes the business side of a, a software technology company, correct? Yeah, that's the last full-time job where I had a T4, which was architecting a new cryptocurrency wallet and rolling out new infrastructure for it, as well as the yes. business and everything else about it as yes. the president of that company. Yes. And in that role, my job was to not write any code. I did write a little bit of it, but with a job like that, you shouldn't be writing code. You should instead be helping other people to write code and to do a good job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, at least while you were doing global regulation, you're, you also had a private practice, and uh, one cannot say that you had it on the side. You had a full-time law practice. Tell us about your law practice, how it evolved, and what is it like now? Also related to my programming career. Mm -hmm. So I summered at BlackBerry, and then articled in McCarthy Tetro, and then when that ended, it was, well, what should I do? Start a practice, join a company. I still have the emails with Shopify with their COO about maybe joining that up and coming company in Toronto. I considered it. I was evaluating that one. I thought they had good prospects. No, I don't regret it. I've been involved in lots of things where lots of people have made far more money than I have. That's life. Um, no, instead I went into another area that's done well, cryptocurrency. So I started my law practice and at the time, and it's not much better today. Lawyers, even tech lawyers, they generally don't know much about technology and definitely not much about internet marketing. And in, back in 2014, I talked to tons of lawyers who said, yeah, well, nobody finds their clients on the internet. That's ridiculous. People get referrals, you know, from their trusted lawyers at the big firms. That is not true. I have the log data to show people checking my website from, you know, Ford Motor Company in the States. And you can see, as people are reading this stuff, sharing it on LinkedIn, on Twitter. I don't hear this very much from people anymore. I think people know now that clients aren't stupid and they do research like anyone else. And the internet is a part of their research. You can't ignore that. It's where people source a huge amount of vendors from. So I set up my website specifically to do well in Google. 
And within a few months of starting my practice, I was number one result for Toronto Technology Lawyer. And then that's where most of my business came from originally. And that led me to working with the co-founder of Ethereum, which was just starting up at the time, and then the other Ethereum people. And that's where my law practice shifted ever more into the cryptocurrency and blockchain space. Um, partly because it's the most interesting, partly because this is the area that scares other lawyers the most because they have no idea how any of this stuff works. And a lot of people really value having a lawyer that doesn't just know what the business of that is, but actually understands how it works and that it's not magic. And that's where my law practice today came from. Mm -hmm. And I still enjoy that the most. It's still the most interesting. And my clients are always coming up with new and interesting products and projects. And it's incredibly challenging to work with them on some of the stuff, but that's what makes it rewarding. And I think that's one of the best things you can do with a law career is to try to help people to bring new things into the world. Why uh, companies, technology companies hire lawyers like you? Some of them hire me because they've had terrible experiences with large firms. Um, those are some of my favorite clients because it's usually an easier conversation with them about some things with law and they usually have low standards. Um, no, I'm being a little facetious about that, but what people want from me is they want somebody who's really involved. They want somebody where that's just not a file for them amongst 200 and you know, a little toggle where they're clicking a timer. My work with people, I've abandoned hourly as a model for almost all of my work. So I'm essentially like a part-time employee for my clients. I'm a team member, like I'm in their Slack channel. I'm helping them with things where there's fast turnaround, where you're really involved and embedded into the business. And you have a much better understanding of what's going on and can give people better and faster advice. Well, you're a corporate commercial lawyer, correct? Yes. You don't do litigation. So there are these two big camps in law practice, litigation and uh, transactions. Um, and you're in this, in this latter camp. Now, there are several models for uh, using a lawyer. There is a question answer model. There is a uh, document drafting model. There is a uh, model where the lawyer simply tells the company what to do. Um, perhaps in uh, their capacity as general counsel. So as, as a member of the senior leadership team, what day-to-day -day, uh, form does your work with your clients take? Queries, a lot of drafting. What does it look like on average? Everything and real advice, fast turnaround and stuff. Some deal comes onto the table. People want help with it right now. My clients are pretty rapidly advancing their businesses in general, often high growth companies. They need to do things quickly. That's part mm -hmm. of the model. Um, giving people real advice. Now, within the last year, that's ranged from a 60 page memo for a client about a complicated topic of their business, all the way to the two paragraph email. And what form that takes depends really on what I think is the best way to help them. And on the contract drafting side, a major reason why people hire me and why they keep hiring me is that I'm usually given very vague ideas about what people want in a contract. They give me some really high level concept of what they want. And they say, Addison, you know everything about our business. You know about this industry, you know about this deal. You tell us what should be in this mm -hmm. contract. Mm -hmm. And that's a service that's quite hard to get from lawyers and by handling quite a lot of that myself where it's really okay i'll put in what i think based on what you say and then you can review that better fits with how a lot of executives want to be doing business where people can't imagine what terms might go in there and it's too painstaking for them to think about that mm -hmm. but given something back to them and what the choices are and how this could be that's a lot more actionable mm -hmm. so that kind of trust in drafting contracts i'd say is one of my advantages too. I don't approach it as a pure lawyer and say, okay, you give me the term sheet with everything thought through, mm -hmm. and then I'll find a template on the internet and edit a little bit to what you said. 
-hmm. Are most of your clients startups? Mm -hmm. So they probably don't have general counsel or a legal team in house and you're essentially Some are, of them do. One of my do. clients right now does. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but most of them, do most of them treat you as this in-house lawyer on demand? Yes. So this is what you essentially are. Uh, even though you are in private practice, mm -hmm. you provide uh, some kind of assurance or confidence to your client that they have a legal department, no matter how small it is. I don't think many people want that. Mm -hmm. Why I do think people... that's an important feature, but I think yeah. nobody cares about that. Um, probably because most small businesses don't have lawyers at all. And a lot of people do deals without the benefits of lawyers. And startups just know that everything they're doing is risky. And they say, well, what's the real difference here of me doing it myself versus paying a bunch of lawyers or a lawyer to do this work for me? Most Canadian small businesses have no legal representation. There's no one to help them. Right? Yes. Now, yes. in my niche, and most of my clients have investment money behind them, that makes sense. They need that. They're building new businesses. They need new templates. They need new ways of working. Um, but surprisingly, that's not really in demand. And I think the reason for that is just most people realize lawyers are too expensive, and the benefit is often rather limited. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the client mindset. So when you said that they don't really know if they need a legal department or, or that they don't think they need a legal department, uh, or when you said that, uh, uh, that, that you, your clients already know that they're doing risky things. I have two questions here. First of all, what is client's view of why we have lawyers in this society, number one. And number two, when you say that your clients already know that they do things that in involve risk, how do they know risk? Because I assume you're talking about legal risk. No, oh, all risk. Legal risk all is risk. just a dimension. It's okay. And they okay. understand that there's question marks next to all of those risks. Mm -hmm. And are you responsible then for the legal side of risk? For your clients for sure okay so uh that then ties back to my first question what is clients especially among technology companies or startups what is their view of why we have lawyers in this society or, or why companies like them need lawyers i doubt anyone's considered that question nobody asks but, why we have lawyers same as nobody asks why we have a ministry of labor, right? It's just somebody imposed that on you. I think most entrepreneurs recognize that. Like they didn't create the system. Mm -hmm. I often have people ask me, oh, well, what's the reason for this? Mm -hmm. Well, there is no reason. It's not based on reason. Somebody just decided to do that a long time ago and did that. Like there's mm -hmm. no comprehensive system of things based on principles and reason in Ontario, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a grab bag of random laws and institutions and things you have to deal with. And I think very few people actually stop and consider what's the role of lawyers. But I think if they did stop and ask that question, they'd probably regard lawyers mostly as a racket. Mm -hmm. so, Which is a little unkind to lawyers, but yeah. you know, there's a bit of truth to that. And certainly that's the perception of lots of tech entrepreneurs, I think. They don't have a good view of lawyers. And many of them have had direct bad experiences with lawyers too, where their experience doesn't live up to what the lawyers promised. Right. So then, uh, if I understand you correctly, clients see lawyers as a necessary evil, uh, as uh, a part of a legacy system that contributes nothing to their business, but that they need to account for in, in order to be safe from this system? Is not, this a not my clients. Not your clients? No, because most of the things I'm working on are positive business deals. They're not really defense. There's a little bit of that, but usually it's building new things. Um, but I don't think many people view lawyers like that. Like you can see the value. If you're not getting lawyer value, you drop them, right? Like mm -hmm. this is a business and they do, right? Like, mm -hmm. 
people have a choice of counsel and they switch if they're not satisfied. Mm -hmm. well, well, let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of a deal. Um, so obviously, uh, clients, your clients understand they need a lawyer to conclude a deal or to prepare no. a deal. They don't. They, they just know it's going to be a lot better. All right. So, and they can quickly see, see the results. I see. So what you're saying is your, your services are not viewed as absolutely necessary, but they are viewed as valuable, as, as, as having a potential of improving the outcome. For sure. Nobody would pay my fees if they didn't think they're going to get great results. And they won't continue paying my fees month after month unless they're mm -hmm. seeing good results. Well, and most of well, my clients are keenly aware of what things cost. Right, right. So let's talk about those results. So how do clients see good results? What is a good result to an average client for a lawyer like yours? New good quality policies and procedures, new good quality contract templates, less risk, faster deal execution time, a more organized business, a business more compliant with laws, with mm -hmm. lower risk of the government doing something to them. Mm -hmm. uh, in all dimensions. Mm -hmm. And as a lawyer, I, especially advising smaller companies, I think it's incumbent upon them to try to do that. But lawyers have a lot of value to add for businesses and they should try to help people in all of those areas. Mm -hmm. I think some lawyers prefer not to do that. They'd say, well, I don't really want to get involved in these areas. Mm -hmm. But if you see something, you should tell your clients about it. And I have lots of clients, they hear about some issue, they say, well, that's interesting, maybe. You know, I understand what you're saying here about the risk, but why don't we do that one in two months? Why don't we do that in three months? We have priorities. Mm -hmm. That's a major part of my work. There's a million things to do as a startup. What's the list? And then how do you prioritize that to get the best results out of it? Mm -hmm. So it's essentially order and peace of mind. This is what you're bringing on board. Um, allowing and Better your... quality deals. Definitely without my work clients would have a lot more challenges in dealing with other companies and in making sure that their deals are reasonable deals that will work out well. How do you measure uh, the quality of a deal? You can't. But can, and no one can tries, I... amazingly. No one yeah. considers the they economic should, risks right? involved, really. Mm -hmm. sure, but risks? You, you can't. Right? There's no way to properly estimate that because the things are unknown and law is just full of basically myths about things, right? On indemnities and warranties and these kinds of things. And people will mm -hmm. insist on all kinds of stuff. They have no basis to insist on that. They have no idea what the mm -hmm. actual statistics are. They have no idea how commonly these terms are litigated. They don't mm -hmm. know how commonly these terms lead to disputes. And I think it's impossible probably to do that because almost everything is private about these contracts. Like there's never going to be a database that has that, mm -hmm. but you can deal with it in other ways. So usually what I'm trying to do is to come up with the simple deal that best reflects what the parties want to do. Mm -hmm. um, that might sound like very trite advice, but for me, that does not mean a 40 page, you know, standard term template. Lots of people mm -hmm. would be much better served with a one or two page agreement that captures exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. And other people, maybe they need something longer. Mm -hmm. um, I try to eliminate as much as possible, ruthlessly, legalese, form parts of agreements. You can dramatically cut things down and also have an agreement that's far more likely to be signed by the other side. Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely, as a litigator, as a commercial litigator, I definitely think it's better if 99% of deals are based on short uh, documents than if 50% of deals are based on long documents. Because in my view, the, the long document uh, culture among corporate commercial lawyers excludes certain companies or, or businesses from uh, using lawyers entirely and they resort to uh, handshakes, they resort Oh, I don't to... think that's true. They resort to not reading it. 
or, or they resort to not reading it, which is also have very no bad. idea what's in their templates that their lawyers mm -hmm. are supplying. Right. And then they're I've stuck seen, with it because they, they, they are seen by courts as sophisticated parties who had legal uh, representation. Mm -hmm. Try to get out of that one. Right. But if you try to tell people that they should have an agreement with less legalese and that should be shorter and written in simple English that everyone understands, mm -hmm. there are quite a few people who push back on that idea. They say, well, shouldn't it be longer? Isn't Clients? longer better? Yeah. For sure. mm -hmm. is, because is, is it, is it, because is there's a longer culture better? of this. Yes. There's a culture of just making 20 page form agreements that go on forever and explain the same thing five different ways in three different parts of the agreement and to review and edit these things and slows things down. And very few people stop and think, are all of these terms necessary? All of these terms are really what the clients want. Is this an agreement that anybody wants? Or does mm -hmm. this just reflect something from a book that might mm -hmm. be applicable to many people's circumstances? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, unfortunately, contracts are unlike computer code. So if something is not in the computer code, it cannot be read in or implied. Uh, it simply doesn't exist. If something is not in the contract, uh, come litigation time, it can definitely be read in, implied, or simply uh, um, imposed by some statute or act of legislature. So that's well, one thing. Nobody litigates contracts. Contracts are never litigated. And yeah. you would say, well, that's not true. I've litigated contracts, Addison. Sure. Almost all contracts, 99.99% or something, they're never litigated. They're this never is a very court. important point. I really thank you for making this point because when you first said no one litigates contracts, I, I, my first thought was absurd. This is crazy. I mean, that's what I do, right? But uh, litigators have blinders or, or, or blinkers, right? And all we see is disputes. And then we sometimes forget about the real world, which is really dispute free. If you very think about few it. clients appreciate my sales pitch to them on this, where I tell them, you know, they ask me about litigation. I say, well, my job is to make sure you don't litigate. My job is to make sure you never have to talk to a litigator. And I consider mm -hmm. that to be success. Mm -hmm. that's, Good that's... quality deals that explain what the parties want. Mm -hmm. They're not likely to litigate that. Mm -hmm. giant agreements where nobody understands what's in it. And later somebody, when there's a dispute, pours through all of it and says, oh, hey, look, section 1623, that one is a maybe. I can see how that could mean now. Right, right, right. So basically what you're saying, the more stuff you put in the contract, the more, the more litigation ammo you give to potential adversaries. Sure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. This is a very but interesting But more importantly, point. are the agreements really what they wanted? Where an agreement reflects what the parties actually wanted to do in their deal, they're very mm -hmm. unlikely to litigate that. Most business people are committed to the deals they do, even with no paperwork behind them. Right. Lots of these people right. have repeat interactions with the same people. You're not going to litigate against them because they're your business partner. Well, this is, this is fantastic. This is really interesting. Um, and uh, I really like this point that most business people are committed to their deals. So most people mm -hmm. are, are good. Most people want to do right by, by their business partners. Nobody uh, goes into business or most people don't go into business with the intention to breach their contract. There's a small group of people uh, who do, but then they really end up on, on uh, the radar of people like me. So, of course, the perception oh, no, of people like don't. me is skewed. They don't? They never, they never do. Almost everyone in Canada, if they have a problem, they just get screwed. They never get to talk to a lawyer. There's no one to help them. I see a ton of stuff all the time of people cheating people, on business deals and investments and things like that. It's common. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And no one will do anything about it so long as it's within the context of a business. If you try to call the police about something, Mm -hmm. They'll say, that's a civil matter, not our problem. Is it? A ton of things now in modern Canada are basically laundered through companies where they, they do things that would be illegal. But in the context of a business, it's suddenly not illegal. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Interesting. You just um, uh, gave me another perspective on my own work when you said, you know, most, yes, Pulat, you work with, uh, with uh, bad apples or you, uh, you mostly work with bad cases. But even with your scoot percep perception, Pulat, you're not seeing the vast majority of bad cases because they never even end up litigated, litigated or they never even uh, end up in any kind of dispute resolution. People just give up before they even try anything, right? Not even give up. No one will help you at all. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it also, of Almost course, depends. Almost every dispute people have in Canada, there is no one to help you. Mm -hmm. It's a mirage, all these systems, right? Like mm -hmm. the court system is largely for rich people, whether that's rich companies or rich individuals. And it, the tiniest fractions of things are dealt with like that. If you look at the statistics for things like anti-fraud hotlines that the government has or complaints about things, mm -hmm. first off, almost no one even knows you can complain because it's rarely the case in Canada that regulated businesses are required to put up signs that tell you how you can complain. That's something we don't really do in English Canada, at least. And the result is nobody knows they can complain. And when you do, no one does anything. Virtually all complaints to the government about aspects of anything to do with businesses go nowhere. And no one will help you with your problem. Lawyers are like the last resort of desperate people who've been stonewalled and are usually very angry. I've had tons of people reach out to me over the years for their various problems. Lots of them egregious. Mm -hmm. No one will help you with them. That's the thing that nobody really wants to say about the legal system in Canada and our structures of government. We have all these ministries set up and they claim that they deal with all the problems in this area, but they don't help people. They deal with only a tiny percentage of it. Mm -hmm. but Lawyers many... are the fallback of people where everyone has told you no, right? If people could get real results through the government, they would. That's why I'm always annoyed when I hear, particularly litigators being demonized by people in the news as if they're somehow the cause of these problems. When lawyers help their clients to win, it's because they had a good case. It's because the other people were wrong and no one would help you. If you see anything involving a consumer, no consumer's first choice is to hire Pulat Yunusov to sue somebody for some problem. They've mm -hmm. complained, they've complained to the government, they might've complained to the police and no one will help you. And then legal system is where you look as your last resort. Right, right. Well, that's been my impression as well that uh, at least our courts are mostly reserved for uh, commercial parties. Uh, Rich open, people, you mean. <laughs> uh, if you will. No, uh, sorry. Open. No, not that. It's for everyone. As long as they can pay fifteen, twenty-five thousand dollars up front mm -hmm. for a 50-50 shot at maybe having somebody give them a good, good outcome. Yeah, yes, it's, uh, it's true for, for most people, you're right. But uh, for large, sophisticated commercial parties. I've had tons of lawyers tell me that they couldn't afford to hire a lawyer to deal with their problems. Mm -hmm. Lawyers themselves. For sure. Yeah, yeah, it's a big problem. But what do you think about this theory? Uh, let's refer it uh, as the author of his own misfortune, where a lot of disputes arise because people consciously or uh, unconsciously assumed risk. People do stupid things, give money to obvious fraudsters, for example, right? Or don't put things in writing or don't know anything about business, but go into business and go all in, like mortgage their house. So uh, when, you, when you think about these cases, is it really a, a, in the public interest to ensure that people in those cases also have uh, fulsome access to justice? Is it a mistake for people to assume that all the legal rules they've been told about by all the experts about what the laws are, are true? Why shouldn't somebody be able to assume that when they do something, that the other people will be held accountable and that they will be forced to follow the law? I think it's a very cruel worldview to say, well, that's on them for not knowing that the legal system's not there to help you, or that's on them for not knowing the government doesn't enforce their laws, right? Mm -hmm. Like. Who would expect that? Only lawyers who've really seen how the sausage gets made, right? And they would say, 
Well, you should know no one's actually there to help you. But I think that's very mean to say to regular Canadians because is it really so stupid to think that all these things people say about the legal system are true? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that. I think people should be able to know that when they deal with people that the laws are there and they're enforceable and that they will act on your side. And mm -hmm. I think we need a drastic overhaul of how we do law in Canada in order to get to that point. Because the people you're talking about, that's most people. Mm -hmm. Most people think that they will be protected by the law. Right. But it's just not the case. And instead, lawyers turn around and say, well, you should have known the law's not there for you. But mm -hmm. that's what I mean about the mirage of justice, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, as litigators, we also distinguish uh, the law from enforcement of the law, for example, right? So uh, no regular person makes that differentiation. Yes. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. And you, you're absolutely right to talk about uh, what a reasonable average person can rely on in, in, a, in, a, in a society, in an advanced society such as ours. And it's totally fair to say that people are entitled to rely that the laws will be enforced. For example, I would think that if I buy something from a store and they don't give it to me, I would think the law is there to force them to either give me back my money or give me the thing I pay for. Mm -hmm. But it's not the case. No one right. will do that. Your credit card might, but mm -hmm. there's no one else. Try it. Try complaining mm -hmm. to the Ministry of Consumer Services in Ontario. See what they say about that. Good luck. Mm -hmm. No one will help you. Uh, let's apply this uh, thought process to uh, a commercial deal. Something that you work on on a regular basis. So based on what you said, then I see two aspects to uh, your work. Number one is you draft a document that will manage risks, mostly legal risks, if things go wrong. And everybody crosses their fingers and hopes that this side of your work will actually never be triggered or used. But this, this, the second aspect of your work is... I don't really put it like that. You I don't would put it like say that. How would you put it? Just, I would say that you're distilling the business deal between the two parties down into a reference document that they can look at later to say, oh yeah, that's the deal we made. And that's how we're going to do things. Right. So this is actually what's going to be the second aspect that uh, uh, I'm, I was talking about. So you're essentially... It's more like a, a treaty. Yeah. So when you say the reference document, I really like that term. Uh, you're, you're creating a record, almost a memo for businesses. This is, this is what you agreed on, guys. This is your roadmap. And in theory then, Addison, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a lawyer is not necessary to create this memo. Oh, it is. Most people can't do that. Most people are unable to consider all of the things something could go wrong people and if they weren't they probably wouldn't be doing the deal but people don't have that experience right it's the same as anything you hire people who are specialized in doing that particular thing and when you've done a thousand of them to be quicker at it you'll probably do a better job of it and perhaps more importantly i know more than the clients do about how other people do things too mm -hmm. so you're taking advantage of lawyers knowledge of what's going on in the commercial space that they operate in more mm -hmm. knowledge than the clients have because lawyers see so many more deals and they also have a better idea about the sorts of things people will commonly agree to and mm -hmm. the sorts of mechanisms that businesses often pick in order to deal with certain situations which the clients might not consider but this is business knowledge isn't it so you're essentially a better uh businessman than your client because you've seen so many more deals in this industry, in this sector. I wouldn't say better, but specialized in a certain aspect of their business. And I would hope I know more about those aspects than they do. Otherwise, why are they paying me? I mean, I might be a force multiplier for them by helping to expand their company quicker, but that's not really why people hire me. Mm -hmm. I also do a fair bit of structuring work for people's businesses and products too, mm -hmm. about helping them to design a product that's more compatible with law. Mm -hmm. I see. So let's talk very briefly about 
the way you set up your practice, do you delegate any work, for example? Only to people within my clients' companies, really. You mean they're in-house assets? Um, no, the people who work for the company, if possible. Uh, so you, 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 essentially you have some authority from your client to delegate work to the client's employees? No, usually I deal with one or two people and they would direct the other person to do it. But some of what I do is triaging work like that. A right. little bit of my work is directing other lawyers. Um, that's usually fairly minimal though. It's simple stuff. Task them with right. the work, get the price on it, get them to do the work, follow up on it. Um, I don't delegate within my firm because the firm is just me, but also it wouldn't really be what most of my clients are looking for because they want that expertise and the other person wouldn't have it. And I'm quite efficient at doing lots of my own work anyway. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what I do is trying to squeeze out, you know, busy work and junk paperwork out of my clients practices to help them to streamline how they're doing deals. So right. I have a strong emphasis on creating templates for people and doing things like creating marketing guidelines right. so that the clients and their BD people can then know how to go out and carry out those deals, what they should or shouldn't say, and to try to get them to be able to do it. Because I think that's the best role for somebody who's a specialist. You should be trying to help people to build a workflow that they can repeatedly use without yeah. you. And because I'm paid on a monthly basis, I have no reason not to do that. Although when I was paid on an hourly basis, I did this too. It's just because it's the right thing to do, not because I had any incentive to do it. Mm -hmm. But then I realized if I'm helping people to streamline things and I'm doing it as efficiently as possible, well, other lawyers maybe aren't, well, probably hourly is not a good way to go there. Mm -hmm. And it's not. My practice in switching to monthly, it's much easier dealing with clients. And people have a lot more faith that when I recommend something, it's not because that's going to drive up their cost this month. Right. And uh, just to understand better this fee model, essentially they pay you a flat or fixed monthly fee mm -hmm. until they decide to terminate the relationship with you or you decide yep. to terminate the relationship. And uh, that covers a certain predetermined amount of work or time. No. Mm -hmm. No. So it's to it have someone available on demand to get stuff done at a reasonable pace. I would love to have a lawyer like that. That's just amazing. You know, you pay someone it's a popular. fixed monthly fee. I'm fully booked. <laughs> and yeah, and you have you have general counsel essentially. And if you're not a global conglomerate, uh, that probably satisfies your needs, right? And a lot of lawyers have asked, oh, well, aren't you worried about people just consuming all of your time? They don't because they don't want to read all the things I send them. And legal can only take up such a percentage of executive time in a company. Yes. Nobody is spending all day, every day, right. coming up with busy work for their lawyers to do. That's only yes. something that lawyers would imagine. <laughs> in my work, you do things efficiently, you get things done, you get on to the next deal. That's what people want. So they see the results and they keep paying you. An important caveat, you deal, you deal with uh, busy, sophisticated, smart people for the most, smart clients for the most part. So you're not concerned about shenanigans like uh, five hour phone calls or, uh, you know, a hundred, uh, you know, or 1000 word emails or things like that. Some of my emails are kind of long, but not theirs. They're in a hurry. They've got a business to run, right? That's amazing. Who wants to spend five hours talking about nothing? Uh, talk about the juicy details now. Uh, what are your monthly packages? Um, in theory, there's two. In reality, all of my clients are just on one deal. How much is it? Um, 6,500 right now. Although, hey, this is a public YouTube channel, but I don't even mind disclosing my secrets here on pricing. I'm fully booked and not actually taking on clients at the moment. So that 6,500 is actually rather theoretical. And my clients pay 5K a month, which was what my old rate was. I upped it to 6,500 because I maxed out for work and not taking on anyone at the moment. And my strategy since I did contract programming work many, many years ago was when you're fully booked for everything, raise your price. Or raise and you your just price. Keep raising your price if you're maxed out mm -hmm. and raise it 
to the next level up on that because that's the best way to find out what kind of value you're really providing to people mm -hmm. if people will pay a higher price for it and maybe you were underpricing it before um, i'm not so concerned about that i'm one person i'm not a large law firm trying to optimize everything about what i do and with my clients i often help people who stopped my clients years ago for free give people advice i try and be there for people and my work is not exactly a business i know lots of these people i want to see them succeed i really want to see the startups i work with mm -hmm. succeed that's fun mm -hmm. for me this is a interesting job where i get to work with smart interesting people and that's why i keep doing it. there's lots of things you can do to make money Many of them are not so great for the world. Many of them are not so fun for the people doing it. I get to help people who pay their small business employees well, they treat them well, they're building great new things, they have good business practices. I help them make them even better. I enjoy that. It's the kind of work I like doing. And I think we need more lawyers like you, Addison. And uh, if I were to start a company, I know that uh, I know the standard that I will be looking for in a lawyer now. Thank you so much. This has be, been uh, before you go. The standard should be high, yeah. and people should scrutinize their lawyer's work. I've I've come across a lot of people who've done work very quickly or not that great for their clients, and the clients don't know any better, right? And they don't stop to ask. But lawyers are different, and people should really be questioning their lawyers on these things and make sure their lawyers are doing the right job. That's certainly true. Thank you so much, Addison. It's been a great pleasure and I hope to have you back someday and maybe we'll talk about how clients should choose lawyers. Thank you, Pulat. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.